like to introduce our first speaker uh, today, uh, Dr. Marcel Cornfield, who is a professor of archaeology at the University of Wyoming. Uh, he says he was predisposed to the past as a child in Croatia, where he spent his early years vacationing among Roman ruins in the Adriatic and stumbling around medieval castles. Uh, and it's clear from looking at uh, Marcel's Vita that he remains fascinated with the past. And he pursues and shares that fascination through his teaching and through his research. He's involved in a number of archaeological projects um, investigating Paleo-Indian occupations and human habitations, uh, adaptations to plains and foothills and the mountainous areas of the western United States, including Hell Gap, where you just came from yesterday, right, Marcel? Yes. Just in time to get on the plane and get up here to Sheridan. Um, also Agate Basin and High Mountain Parks of Colorado. He teaches, of course, a number of courses in um, anthropology and archaeology, things like patterns of subsistence, zooarchaeology, paleo-Indian prehistory, among others. And he's published a number of books. One is the first Rocky Mountain uh, Mountaineers, the first Rocky Mountaineers, uh, Coloradans before there was Colorado. And for that, he won the Indy Fab Bronze uh, Award uh, for the Rocky Mountains. And he has just a new book is coming out. Uh, with Bruce Huckel, uh, uh, entitled Stones, Bones, and Profiles, Exploring Archaeological Context, Early American Hunter-Gatherers, and Bison. Uh, is it out yet? No. We can't buy it yet? No, you can't. Oh, darn. OK, and but we will. It's really a best script for George Griffin and, and Steve Ann Haynes, who are okay. George's UW uh, professor. Yeah, right. OK, well, that will be forthcoming. So uh, Marcel received his baccalaureate degree from the University of New Mexico, his master's from the University of Wyoming, and his PhD from the University of Massachusetts. So um, I'd like to welcome Marcel Kornfeld. Uh, th thank you for that uh, over-the-board introduction. Uh, and, and thank you for the invite. I'm delighted to be here. Uh, to talk to you folks, uh, but as well to see this, uh, this, uh, this facility, which is, uh, which is really great. And to be in the mountains, and in terms of what I'm talking about, I think you'll understand uh, why this area and looking up the mountain is important for what I'm talking about. So I, I, I assume, actually, for, and I think that this came out of uh, Maggie's introduction, that uh, uh, I was invited here to talk about the mountains, since we are in the mountains, and since I know just a little bit about what some people did in the mountains at one point in prehistory. Well, with that, I just want to introduce you a little bit to the, uh, my lab and uh, where, the, where we've been working. And as you can see from down in Colorado, Middle Park, where the red line is, uh, up through the Prior Mountains, uh, which is the farthest um, north yellow circle right over here. Uh, that's pretty much all in the Rocky Mountain uh, areas and mountainous environments, with the exception of the stuff that's kind of in, in, in eastern uh, Wyoming. And also to sort of acknowledge at least some of the people that uh, work with me. Archaeology is not a, a, uh, something that you do by yourself. Uh, and in fact, these are only a few uh, of the people that have contributed, people from other universities, other departments, uh, yeah. hundreds of students uh, and, uh, and volunteers. So um, this is just in a way of acknowledging them. Uh, so what I'm talking about, yeah, is my research, but all of these people are part of it. So what I'm talking about is Mountain Paleo Indians or uh, people between about 12,000 and 8,000 years ago in the Colorado's uh, Middle Park. There are some things around here that date to about that time period too, but you'll perhaps see why I um, focus on Middle Park. And uh, the talk will really be into, in with the start with the prelude, go through four acts, and uh, have what I call an afterward. This may be a little unusual way the way archaeology is presented, but this is the way I present it, uh, at least for this talk and some similar ones. Uh, first, I want to just sort of set the stage <coughs> for, uh, for what I'm talking about, present some uh, ideas and concepts that then play a role in some of my conclusions. 
uh, getting groceries is about uh, how did these people get their groceries? You know, they didn't have grocery stores, so what did they do? Uh, some of you probably know at least something about that. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, we'll talk specifically how these, the evidence we have about uh, a Middle Park Paleo Indians. Um, uh, hey, Mr. Peabody certainly has to do with, uh, <laughs> with Peabody uh, coal and, ex uh, and, and mineral um, exploitation because people have been mining for years, uh, half a million years, if, if not more, different things, things for tools uh, and other sorts of uh, things that they uh, needed as part of their life ways. Um, Act 4, shelter for, from the storm. Um, uh, shelters are important, uh, especially in mountainous environments. Not all hunter-gatherers have, uh, well, all hunter-gatherers have come some kind of shelters, but there are, they're specifically more important when you're uh, up at uh, high altitudes for a variety of reasons. Uh, and I'll finish with uh, an afterwards. Now, this is kind of an unusual part. You probably haven't heard from any archaeologists, but I start with a little story. Uh, Saviot of the Williams Fork Band woke up on a cold morning cuddled in a warm buffalo skin. She well recalled the hunt that netted the skin, the hard work that followed skinning the carcasses, the festivities and joys that accompanied acquiring so many animals. The visiting with friends and cousins she hadn't seen for so long, and the former bows and lovers who now lived with their closer kinfolk. The picture is by a friend of mine, and it actually depicts one of the archaeological sites that I'll be talking about in a moment. To continue the prelude, this was a particularly big gathering underneath the sacred mountain of the wolf. If you know Middle Park, Wolford Mountain is what this refers to, and it is in the background there. Everyone attended who could. Some came from the side of the uh, rising sun through deep gorge, others from the land of the rabbit ears, yet others from the land of the winter sun with its deep, lush forests. Before the hunt, many had visited the mountain and made offerings to the spirits for success and long life. And others had fasted and stayed in little enclosures several nights in hopes of stimulating their senses and accepting nature's wisdom. Um, this is sort of a hypothetical uh, middle park with these some areas that I've talked about. Again, if you're familiar with the area, you'll recognize uh, some of the names, including land on the buffalo and antelope, which of course is uh, in front of the front range and out in the <coughs> uh, open plains. Basically, this story, and uh, if you want to read more of it, it's in, in my book, at the end of my book. You can look at this as a hypothesis, or perhaps a series of hypotheses about early Paleo Indians in Middle Park. Uh, such hypotheses as perhaps they hunted bison uh, in uh, mass kills, in other words, not as a single animal, but in, uh, in mass uh, kills. Perhaps they hunted them, hunted them communally, where a number of bands and groups come together. Human groups dispersed uh, and aggregated for various purposes, uh, as hunter-gatherers do anyway. Uh, hunters, uh, hunts were accompanied uh, by rituals, plant, and uh, they planned communal activities and collected information to enhance uh, planning. And you can create a series of other uh, hypotheses about uh, Paleo-Indian lifeways, if you wish, from uh, that short story. What I like to talk about is high altitude and high altitude environments. And these are defined as regions that are above 2,500 meters in elevation. And many anthropologists, archaeologists, and, uh, and others call this, these areas the top being the top of the world. They're high. And they have certain characteristics that are important for any uh, organism to live in. Uh, Tibetan plateau, everybody knows about, Ethiopian plateau, uh, and the Andes are very well known. Uh, some of the other areas not so well known, uh, but right over here it includes areas of uh, Colorado, including Middle Park. There are certain interesting aspects of this in that the Tibetan Plateau, a lot of people actually live on the very southern end of that, and their climate and everything else is somewhat ameliorated uh, by uh, winds coming from the Indian Ocean. Uh, Ethiopian Plateau is at uh, equator and uh, basically at the equator. Um, and um, 
a lot of the Andes is, is closer to the equator. All of this uh, makes some of these areas of the Rocky Mountains uh, quite a bit harsher uh, in terms of the things that, uh, that are important for adapting to these environments. Uh, Mark Aldendorfer, an anthropologist working in, archaeologist working in uh, uh, Peru, uh, defines uh, high mountain environments uh, as those that exhibit sufficient local relief to show elevation related changes in ecological structure or over relatively short distances. Like if you're coming from Sheridan to here, you're going through a series of zones. We're very familiar with this in, <coughs> in the West. Uh, however, some of these have an absolute elevation greater than 2,500 meters and a part of human adaptive si uh, systems for a significant portion of the year. And that's really the important part that humans are in these areas uh, more than just uh, visiting like we all are right now here. So, uh, as I said, some people call these areas and think of them as being on the top of the world, and they indeed are. Okay, I did that. Um, so, why is 2,500 meters, which, by the way, is where we are, so if you're out of breath, uh, you know why. You're affected by hypoxia, which is lack of oxygen due to low barometric pressure. Uh, and this causes various uh, conditions and illnesses, including possibly death, including death in some instances, obviously not uh, a lot, but it can do that. Cold stress, as is cold this morning, uh, exacerbates hypoxia, and certainly it is always colder in the mountains than it is, well, not always, but it's usually colder in the mountains for a longer period than in the valleys. Uh, so the bottom line is things like high altitude it, illness, the worst of which being things like uh, high altitude uh, pulmonary edema, which can kill you uh, without going to low elevations immediately, uh, and limited work potential. For hunter-gatherers, this is essentially walking. Uh, you know, this is, uh, this, th this is why Peruvians chew coca, because it increases your work potential. And, uh, <clears throat> and um, so, so anyway, for hunter-gatherers, a lot of their work consists of walking, going and getting resources. Several assumptions uh, that I make about Middle Park. Uh, one is that uh, Middle Park was occupied by a single macro band. What we mean by macro bands is somewhere between two and 500 people. It's essentially, in a, in a, in a population sense model, uh, a group that can, people that can sustain itself. You need so many people so they can find mates, so they can marry, so they can have babies, and so they can reproduce. Otherwise, if the group is too small, it simply dies out. Um, these, these are usually divided up into bands with band territories. Of course, this ranges depending when you are, if you're in the Kalahari or in the uh, Arctic, uh, but somewhere around 2,000 square kilometers. These are totally hypothetical, uh, although for Middle Park. Do you guys know where Middle Park is? Okay, it's, it's, it's uh, well, this is not going to help very much, uh, but that's about, uh, that's about Denver area and to the west over the, uh, the front range right over here. You get into Middle Park, bounded by Rabbit Range, Park Range, and then a series of high ranges over here. All of this area here is the Continental Divide. I'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, another uh, assumption is that uh, they're permanent residents of Middle Park. And there is some archaeological data to suggest that people have been permanent residents in the, uh, in the park. And I say this because there is a classic Western assumption that goes back years and years that mountains were not occupied, that ma mountains are uh, um, uh, marginal environments where you can't make a living, uh, that prehistoric peoples, various places, didn't occupy them permanently but only temporarily. And, you know, you can kind of see this. Uh, you know, people go to mountains and hike, and they come down. They go to mountains to ski, and they come down. Very few people actually uh, live there. So, but this is a perception that's in the literature that goes back years and years. And, and, and it's probably wrong. Um, uh, and uh, the other assumption is that in order for us to understand prehistoric or historic or any other uh, adaptations, we're going to have to look at montane biocultural adaptations. In other words, how does biology work together 
uh, with cultural systems uh, to, to live there. Now, a lot of people, when I give similar talks to, to this, um, question the fact that um, Middle Park and other areas of Middle Park, uh, of, uh, of the Front Range uh, and, the, uh, and the basins there are actually high altitude. Well, <coughs> this is, uh, and I don't have an attribution, but this is from a publication uh, that shows birth weights of, uh, uh, of newborns. So at sea level, uh, you have roughly around 3,400 uh, grams for newborns at 5,000 uh, meters. Uh, you have considerably less maybe uh, closer, under, under 3,100, maybe 2,900 some uh, grams. Now, here's Colorado, way down here at 2,700 grams. So, and in fact, it's, it, it is partly uh, data from Middle Park. This is modern data from modern people. Um, uh, it's data from Leadville, which is actually, okay, not in Middle Park, but it's the same. Elevation, Breckenridge, which is in Middle Park, Fair Play, and a few other of these uh, high mountain uh, areas and, and zones. The bottom line of this is that uh, if you're a hunter-gatherer, uh, a lot fewer of your pregnancies will, well, not only will be successful, uh, but uh, the newborns will uh, not survive uh, with these lower birth weights. And, and, and so therefore, you'll have to produce more babies, that takes energy, and, and so on and so forth. So, but the only point of this for me is that, yes, indeed, Middle Park and areas of uh, similar areas are indeed uh, high altitude and problems of hypoxia, et cetera, uh, do occur. Uh, just some... Uh, <coughs> from North Park, Middle Park, South Park, San Luis Valley, and Gunnison Basin. Uh, these are the high areas. Uh, in fact, North Park is all above 2,500 meters. Middle Park has, and this is very interesting, uh, you know, the fact is the bottom of uh, North Park is rather flat, whereas Middle Park is terribly uh, uh, uneven, which means you need even extra energy to get around this. It's a lot easier to walk across this flat North Park than it is here, and kind of uh, South Park is sort of in between, but it's actually at an even higher elevation. So all of these areas are going to be affected by uh, this sort of thing. Uh, how do hunter-gatherers cope with high altitude? Well, we need to look at biological adaptations and cultural adaptations. I'll talk about latter mostly, but in terms of biological adaptations, we have what's called developmental and genetic. And developmental is basically uh, uh, things like when the Peruvians, uh, you know, if, if, if you're born uh, at high altitude or if you move there at very, 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 very early uh, age, uh, uh, you will develop, for example, barrel chestedness, which gives you more air and oxygen and this sort of stuff. Uh, genetic ones, of course, are much longer term, and both Tibetan and <coughs> other high altitude populations do have a variety of genetic adaptations. Uh, which is another whole interesting subject, and you have to invite somebody else to talk about that, because <laughs> um, it's way above me. Um, cultural adaptations are things like trying to increase your calories, and in this situation, uh, things like fat are particularly important. Uh, increase uh, protection, uh, which you can do in several different ways, uh, and getting lower quickly. Uh, also information, but that's something that I just started working on, so I'm not going to talk about that. Uh, it's not possible to really get lower quickly if you're in Tibetan Plateau. Uh, it's also not possible to get lower quickly if you're a hunter-gatherer in Middle Park or North Park or South Park. And you don't have two days to walk out because you probably can't walk because you're sick. <coughs> so now um, one way to co cope with cold stress is through clothes making, and Paleo Indians had clothes making, not only in Middle Park, but elsewhere. They had bone needles. You need bone needles to make a very tight clothing, gravers, scrapers, all of these things uh, that uh, archaeologists have shown have to do with making clothes. Just to show you some areas of Middle Park, here in the uh, northwest corner of the park, you're looking at the uh, Alpine 
and mixed forest along the, um, uh, the park range. Uh, down here, kind of the open country of uh, muddy and, uh, and, and blue rivers uh, with mountains in, in the background. Uh, up here, uh, tundra and al alpine coniferous forests and uh, in the Caribou Lake area al al around the, the front range. So this is all the very, and, and these massive uh, uh, forests, coniferous forests, that cover the in-between areas. So that's sort of what, what Middle, Middle Park uh, looks like. Another aspect important for hunter-gatherers is uh, structure of the resource. So how is the resource structured, the people, the thing that they would be dependent on? Well, uh, we can, this is not necessarily the, the resource itself, but we can use some modern data to model that. So this is the dispersion of deer through Middle Park as it has been recorded uh, in the uh, low areas, in the, uh, in, the, in, the, uh, in the basin itself. And so what you see that in, Jan uh, in uh, October, November, December, January, February, March, lots of deer sightings because they have all come down to the basins. Uh, in uh, April, May, June, July, not so many uh, deer sightings. That's because a lot of the deers, uh, deer are in fact up in uh, where we are now and higher. Another aspect uh, of resource structure is when do plant resources become available? So in the basins, maybe April, May, you start uh, growing some plants and you go through November. Uh, if you're higher in the alpine areas, you don't start until May, June. Uh, and, uh, <clears throat> and if you are even higher in tundra, plants don't become available until uh, July, uh, August, and for very short periods of time. So availability of resources really changes. We've been working in Middle Park since uh, uh, early 19, uh, late 1980s, in, in fact. Uh, and uh, I say to present, although I have not done any work there for almost 10 years. Uh, during this time, I recorded 500 Paleo Indian projectile points uh, that come from 70 sites or localities and represent 140 uh, different components. Uh, we tested um, dozens of, or, or somehow investigated about dozens of sites, two of which are bison kill sites, several drive lines, camps, quarries, uh, and so on and so forth. So I want to talk about uh, a few of these. Uh, first of all, the chronology, uh, basic chronology of Middle Park on the left is a general, general chronology of North America, especially Western North America. Uh, from <coughs> uh, around 11,500 years ago to past 8,000. Uh, and you can see that in Middle Park, the diagnostic chronological artifacts uh, span about the same time, uh, given the fact that we probably have a smaller uh, database and sample from there. Uh, I suspect that some of the other time periods will eventually uh, be filled in. Uh, so I want to talk about uh, one uh, place where uh, people uh, uh, hunted uh, bison, apparently, a site called Upper Twin Mountain uh, in the northeastern part of the park, kind of between these two major drainages. Uh, and the site is in what is a slump, which probably is significant, but uh, <clears throat> because at the end of the Pleistocene, uh, because of wetness, there was some extra slumping in the area, but that's, again, another story that's not totally pertinent to my uh, discussion. In any case, you can see the site sits at just about 2,500 meters, just a little above, maybe 50 meters above. Uh, Upper Twin Mountain is a bone bed, so you can see uh, typical uh, bison bones, mandibles, legs, scapulae, and so on and so forth. Uh, not too terribly dense bone bed, but it is uh, a, a bone bed. Uh, we also have five projectile points. As you see over here, a few flake tools and about 80 flakes. Very, very small assemblage, but you only need so much uh, to uh, work with the bison. Uh, the bison bone uh, elements that are present, uh, as you can see, are dominated by the, the darker colors, so mandibles are the most uh, common parts, uh, followed by some leg parts, scapula heads, and a few other parts and others are absent. Um, there was a total of 15 uh, bison that are present and that were supposedly uh, killed and butchered in this place. 
And uh, we know from tooth eruption schedules that this was an early uh, winter occupation. So the question becomes, uh, what is uh, Upper Twin Mountain? Uh, is it the location of a kill, butchery? Is it the location of final products? Or is it a place of a consumption of animal products? We can <coughs> uh, uh, eliminate those two possibilities uh, because of the tools that are or are not present and other evidence of activities, uh, tool diversities, and so on and so forth. So it's a location of a kill uh, and butchery. And usually those two, at least primary butchery, really go together. Uh, one thing that we find is that what we call within bone nutrients, or bone marrow, which is rich in fat, was really heavily uh, exploited at this site. So these breaks in bones here indicate that people actually opened those bones and they removed the marrow, presumably they ate it. So to cap off that one, Upper Twin Mountain killed butchery site of 15 animals, late fall, early winter, which is one reason, which is one of the pieces of evidence uh, that Middle Park was occupied uh, all year long because I don't think any self-respecting hunter-gatherer would want to get out of Middle Park uh, later than or early winter. They knew darn well that snow was coming and was going to snow them in. Um, selected elements were removed uh, from this site, and this is a pretty common uh, pattern, is you take the best cuts of meat and you take them away from the kill site to your camp. Uh, and it's a fairly highly processed kill having those uh, bones um, uh, cracked for marrow and removed. Uh, another way, another uh, aspect of getting groceries during Paleo-Indian times, and this is during late Paleo-Indian times, is a site not very far away, less than 10 kilometers, uh, called Jerry Craig. Uh, it has 78 projectile points. Uh, it is also a bison bone bed, as you can see uh, on this slide. But what you can also see, these C, 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 uh, indicate um, uh, choppers, uh, which would, again, be used to process the bison. Uh, and all of these are projectile points, so very dense in terms of projectile uh, points. I'll come back to this in a moment. Bone presence is not too dissimilar to Upper Twin Mountain down on the lower left, dominated by mandibles, head parts. Uh, it's got some other uh, parts represented, but it's a much smaller assemblage, half as many identified elements, uh, and only six animals killed in this case. And it's a late summer uh, season uh, occupation. Uh, we do not see any ma marrow retrieval per se, but we do see those choppers. That could be a function of the sample size. So again, some of the possibilities, what is it? Location of kill, animal butchery, uh, fawn, uh, preparation of final products, uh, or consumption, we can eliminate uh, these two. Upper Twin Mountain and, and Jerry Craig, uh, probably very different, uh, a, a different, a very different ways of procuring uh, your groceries, if you will. Uh, we have a 0.3 projectile points per animal at Upper Tween Mountain. We have 11 points per animal at Jerry Craig site. There are also different seasons, uh, but we see similar transportation of bison parts, the high quality parts going out. The season could explain this, and in fact this kind of picture done by my friend over here uh, shows a bunch of bison coming up in this direction. Uh, and a potential bison trap built, built into uh, this uh, wooded area, which is, by the way, not wooded right now. Uh, the, the, the wood is modeled on the basis of Richard Riders, who was a longtime University of Wyoming professor of soils who studied the soils at this site. And it turns out that the soils down in this area today can be traced back uh, to um, <coughs> coniferous forests of this sort kind of at the end of a little bit after the Pleistocene. Uh, another way that we can uh, sort of uh, think about how they were getting their groceries is an area called Hay Gulch, where we have a bunch of uh, Paleo-Indian uh, sites. And among these are a series of rock uh, cairns along a ridge that form what's known as a drift fence uh, that sort of cuts off uh, an animal track. And this is one way that you drive bison uh, to where you want them. Uh, and, then, uh, uh, and then kill them there. 
Um, and this area has a lot of Goshen and Folsom, in other words, early Paleo-Indian material, including some found right within these cairns. So these cairns, I don't know if they're Paleo-Indian. Uh, uh, there are several ways that we plan to uh, try to get a date on them, but they are associated with some uh, Paleo-Indian projectile points. Uh, another series of sites that are important are continental game uh, traps, continental divide game traps. Uh, on every major pass above 3,600 meters, uh, there are various uh, structures uh, for ambushing game uh, as well as uh, major uh, cairn lines that indicate uh, game traps. And we can really think of uh, Middle Park as a virtual candy store of the Rockies. There's over 88 useful plants, useful for uh, Paleo Indians, some for us today as well. Things like bitter root, yampa, service berry, early balsam root, wild cut carrot, fungi, and many, many, many more. At least 30 of them, or greater than 30, are edible. These all would have been uh, what Paleo Indians would have relied on along with the bison that I was talking about. So let's talk a little bit, uh, and I'm not going to sing. If you want to sing, go ahead. Uh, if, uh, <laughs> but um, so uh, how did Paleo Indians get their stone uh, for making their stone tools? Uh, Wyoming and Colorado over on the left with all of the areas where stone was procured that we know about that are in state historic preservation often files in the two country in the two states um, <clears throat> and uh, on the right over here a place known as Spanish diggings where they actually tunneled down into uh, 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 into the the rock in order to procure their stone uh, so this is we know this from other places, not just Middle Park. In Middle Park, we have actually the same formation. This is Dakota formation, uh, with each one of these dots representing a pit uh, that was used to um, uh, the pit that was used to um, re remove stone. On the left, you can see areas that, that have uh, major stone raw material sources, the one that are kind of zebra colored, and some of the recorded archaeological sites, mostly along Colorado River, some up Muddy Creek, um, that are procurement areas uh, for stone. In Barger Gulch, one of the sites that I'll talk about a little bit, there is a vein uh, of troublesome formation, quartzite, and some prehistoric stone tools that are actually still sitting uh, in these in this little cave rock shelters. Uh, stone was procured ver various ways, but here are some digging tools, like on the left, some digging, chopping tools made out of stone, hammer stones, uh, as well as out of wood, uh, bone, uh, and antler. These were actually found in prehistoric quarry pits uh, in, uh, in Middle Park. Okay, so I just discovered how to make bronze. Ah, I think, well, okay. Uh, no, they, they never did make bronze in Middle Park, uh, and they never just quite got to think out of the rocks, but that's okay. Uh, but to pay some uh, reverence to one of my colleagues who talks about squeezing blood from stones, uh, we need to extract as much information as possible. Paleo-Indian archaeological record is not that uh, terribly um, rich. So uh, how did people make stone tools? Well, Paleo-Indians are a period of, as I said, four or five thousand years, uh, but this is only one of the time periods within that known as Folsom, and this shows us uh, the material for making stone tools in Middle Park, uh, and particularly, uh, particularly uh, projectile points. So Folsom points are fluted. They have this very long channel going from proximal to distal ends. Uh, very interesting process because 50% of them break while they're doing that or some other process. So why are they doing it? Uh, channel flakes are things that come out of that. Uh, in any case, uh, we can study uh, how, uh, how these stone tools were made by looking at this material, where on the landscape they were made and so on and so forth. Uh, we can also look at things like bifaces, preforms, and exotic materials. This material, for example, was brought in from at least 240 kilometers from South Park. Uh, it was brought in in what's known as an Folsom ultra-thin biface or knife. So it was that big. 
it broke or was broken intentionally and then modified into a Folsom projectile point. You can see that this flute that refits on it is right there. Uh, we also have evidence that they were making this biface right at the site called Barger Gulch. This flake was removed from it. This flake was made into a scraper. It was used on the site and it was discarded, thrown away on the site. What that tells us is they were there a long time. Pretty unusual, but if this is a winter occupation, they perhaps might have spent there uh, several uh, months. And this is important information for us to understand how they may have been living. A uh, little bit more blood from stone squeezing is choppers. Uh, Jerry Craig has three choppers. Upper Twin Mountain has some choppers. Um, this is telling us something. Uh, we do find choppers in bison kills across uh, places where we have uh, 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 bison kills, uh, but not in these quite kind of numbers. So I am thinking we're finding them there more because they're processing more bison, because they're trying to extract more marrow, because that's how you get fat, which is uh, important in these sort of hypoxic cold conditions. Looking at stone tools microscopically can tell us what material they were used for. And we find that most are used in softening skins. When your clothes are made out of skins and you're out in the cold and wet in the winter, it's very, uh, uh, it's necessary to soften your clothes. They stiffen up. And so this tells us that that's what was going on. It also tells us a little bit about making those sorts of things. Okay, uh, thanks to Bob Dylan and Shelters from the Storm. Let's look at residential camps a little bit. Um, so hunter-gatherers since the Paleolithic, oh, maybe even longer than that, made dwellings of certain uh, kinds. Uh, this is reconstruction for, from Siberian Paleolithic. For some reason, North American archaeologists don't like to make reconstructions. Uh, they do, but very reluctantly and very few, so I, I use that one. Uh, such structures are visible in a site uh, uh, called Hell Gap, for example, uh, by post holes, not a high altitude site. Uh, Bull Brook, which is uh, a place in Massachusetts, also has what is interpreted as a series uh, of structures. And Mountain Air site in Colorado in the Gunnison Basin uh, has a Folsom structure, in fact, possibly 17 of them. Uh, this is a site of uh, Barger Gulch. Kremlin is right smack there for those of you uh, that know the area. Um, spatial distributions uh, and refits. Well, like the little cartoon said, archaeologists must have a really mind-numbing job uh, to point plot all of those artifacts because every one of these little dots here represent an artifact point plotted three-dimensionally doing excavation so that we can make a map of the area where we think we actually have uh, a hut dating to about 10,500 uh, years ago. There are other Paleo-Indian camps uh, in Middle Park. Uh, there are Continental Divide camps at 3,200 meters on Vail Pass, 34 Caribou Lake, and there are later archaic camps that have uh, 20 uh, structures, Hakal type structures, in other words, kind of those, like those structures that you saw for Siberia, but, but um, plastered in um, uh, uh, clay. Uh, Yarmany House, these are later, but still they show us the use of houses. Um, and outside of Middle Park, as I said, Mountain Air, there's possibly 17 houses. So how did they deal with hypoxia, cold stress, high altitude, and more calories? French are very, uh, uh, have a very, very good imagination, although this is supposed to be Neanderthals over here, but uh, I just like the picture of them trying to bring down uh, this mammoth. I'm not sure who would have been brought down, but whatever. Um, <clears throat> not like this, I don't think they were dealing with hypoxia. So here are some possibilities. Housing. Housing decreases burning of calories. I didn't talk about that, but just having a structure can keep inside warmer by 10 degrees centigrade from the outside overnight in some areas. 
uh, limiting residential mobility, not moving around very much. So at Barger Gulf, we see a potential for a longer-term uh, camp. Uh, using winter game concentrations, which are uh, down in the valleys. Intensive processing. So, as I said, um, those bones that were uh, 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 broken and marrow removed, um, also probably brains and such things, they're all very high fat things and they're very important, especially for uh, uh, women uh, that are pregnant, but they're just you know, simply, fat is important because hunter gatherers live on lean meat. Uh, on wild game, which is lean. So you do have to uh, um, uh, get your extra calories somehow and specific kinds. Uh, clothes making uh, decreases burning of calories. So if you have good clothes, you're not going to lose so many calories, so you don't need so many calories. Uh, and this is indicated by all making abundance of scrapers, gravers, and so forth. I'm getting it. Thank you. <laughs> Look, can't you tell conclusion one? <laughs> no, there is a conclusion two. Um, uh, they are pre-adapted to high and cold environments. Um, they may be pre-adapted to high and cold environments because they may have actually entered the America, uh, Americas uh, over the mountains. That is something that is uh, becoming a real possibility by looking some, at some conditions during the ice ages through Canadian Rockies. Uh, and down into the North America. So that's, that's a, new, a new game I'm sort of playing with. Okay, uh, from, the land of, uh, from the land of the hot summers, Blackhawk, Saviad's sister, brought a yellow light brown shirt with pretty very thin wavy lines. As uh, she was sharing her journey to the land of a buffalo and antelope over the campfire that evening with everyone at camp, Blackhawk handed the stone to Wakara. It would serve him as a reminder uh, of her journey and the needs of the people of the hot summers. Besides, he was the best stone tool maker in the entire land surrounded by mountains. Theirs was one of several hearths uh, and lean-tos in camp. Each was individualized, but all were structured similarly. After the meals at each cut were finished, the camp slowly <coughs> began to gather at Wakara and Saviot's hearth to hear about his journey. The moon was bright that evening. Getting back to their respective huts was easy in the moonlight. The young ones had already gone to their beds when Saviot covered up with her buffalo robe. Wakara was also already in bed, tired from his journey. Life in camp had been good that year. They talk a bit, consider their options for the coming months and next winter, and doze off. And I'm done. for questions, I think. Um, by human remains, you mean bones? Yes. Um, there is about 10 to 15, I would say, human skeletons older than 10,000 years in the entire North America. And no, none of those are in Middle Park. Uh, it's very rare and unusual to find human remains. And honestly, with the government regulations, I don't want to find them. Yeah. Were there any other uh, high-fat food sources these people would have had available? Like what? Well, you're talking about bone marrow a lot. Right. You know, what about like beaver tails or other things that we now know have a lot of fat concentration? I would suspect yes. I don't know about beaver populations in Middle Park in the Pleistocene, but I cannot imagine that they were not there. Uh, I don't have any beaver bones. And there's all sorts of issues of taphonomy, taphonomic processes, what survives, how long it survives, where it was deposited, and so on and so forth. I mean, the reason we find these bone beds, because Paleo-Indian bone beds uh, tend to make 
um, uh, sort of their own little microenvironments. And so they tend to preserve better. You know, when you sort of kill individual animals, bones are just tossed around there and they like go away in a generation or five, ten years or something like that. So, yes, they, that, that, that's a good point. That's a good point to think about what else might have been available in terms of uh, high fat. So how do they transport the marrow? I mean, is that a... I don't know. They could have, they could have eaten it right there. Um, you know, there are, there, there are two things about hunter-gatherers. When they do a, a mass kill, when they kill more than one animal, 10, 15, 20, 50, 100 some, in some cases, they have a tendency, well, they have to, right? They bring everybody there. Because how are you going to butcher those animals? You need, you need all that labor to do that. And, and they tend to hang out there for a while. And that would probably be when they ate the marrow. Then they get their high uh, 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 cuts of meat, high, um, the better cuts of meat. Uh, and uh, they may jerky the meat, dry the meat. Because you can take a buffalo, and if you dry it, you can carry the whole buffalo by yourself virtually, right? Because 90 some percent is water. Once you've dried it, it's very light. Um, so they do all of those things, and then they go away with an awful lot of, of the resource. I don't have a percentage to give you or anything like that. So quite likely, they simply ate the bones right there. I mean the bones of marrow. They obviously didn't eat the bones. At the two kill sites you described, <clears throat> you talk about varying numbers of projectile points and choppers and other items are left there. Those are fairly high intensity to create those. What's the thinking about why there was any material left at those sites? Why did they not gather it up and reuse it? Oh. Um, that's a... a I think for choppers, that's, that's pretty simple. They're, they're, they're pretty simple tools, and they're heavy. You don't want to carry them with you. You make them on the spot, there's a lot of rock. And I believe what they're made out of uh, in this particular instance is all local rock. The projectile points, that's really a good question. A lot of those projectile points are uh, at Jerry Craig's site. The other one has four projectile points. It's, you know, <clears throat> Not very relevant, but, but set, okay, first of all, of the 78 projectile points, probably less than half are anywhere near complete. Uh, and a portion of those, maybe again half, uh, could be reused. They may not be complete, they may be broken, but they can resharpen those, and they do. We can recognize that sort of stuff. Uh, <clears throat> And why didn't they take them away? Um, perhaps they lost them. Perhaps they couldn't find them. Uh, I mean, this is a possibility. Uh, one possibility, like I was saying, that this is a quite possibly a bison, what we call a bison pound, where they pounded them into that enclosure area. And they shot a lot of points in them. Well, maybe they really retrieved a lot of points, and, and those they just didn't find. You know, I really don't know what, what, what was the original number. So, but it's a good question. There's a lot there, a lot, lot there. Very powerful stone masons, you think? <laughs> yeah, can't retrieve them. Got to make new ones. Good point. How far would you think that their grocery shopping, their processing plant, whatever, to their settlements would be when they all come together, how far away would those be? When they all, uh, let, let me see if I understand this. You mean when the entire macro band comes together? Right. right. And I know you had some slides where you showed where it was estimated where they were, but I don't know how that relates 
where some of the settlements, the micro yeah. were. When the macro, yeah. Okay. Sizes. I have it more in the rest of the story that I didn't tell. Um, Hunter and gatherers, when they come together in macro bands, which is a very important social activity, it's important at the time that you're finding, you know, mates and, and, and visiting with relatives to where you might end up going for your, you know, during bad times or whatever, when it's dry in your, your homeland and so on and so forth. Almost in all of those instances where hunter gatherers come together, it's when there is some sort of a, a windfall. So, for example, in the Great Basin, grasshoppers sometimes die by the billions on the salt lakes or, or other lakes uh, and wash ashore. And they just, you know, this is a time they gather and go and they roast the grasshoppers. Uh, in Australia, hunter-gatherers tend to come together when there are certain um, moths that are, they just, be, you know, it's almost like grizzly bears up in Yellowstone when we eat moths because there's just millions of moths. Um, so this, um, uh, these kill sites may be one of those situations where a number of groups came together. And, you know, that's partly what I suggested in, uh, in, in, in several little hypotheses I, I threw together at the beginning, is that this may be where a number of bands come together. In fact, I haven't looked at Jerry Craig so much, but the interesting thing about Upper Twin Mountain, uh, there's only five projectile points, so you know, no statistics here. Uh, but the five projectile points are, I think, from three or four major raw material sources in different parts of Middle Park. So that does suggest that people came in from different places. Uh, to this particular location, could be. Uh, the other thing is uh, Yampa, which uh, is sometimes uh, occurs in concentrations that might be high enough uh, to gather people together. So in other words, I don't think when people come together, they don't tend to go very far to get the resource. They want to have that resource within a few kilometers. And so they're not spending time trying to gather up what they're going to eat. They're spending time where they're, or what they're doing there. Does that answer your question? Or yeah. did I go in some other direction? Do these people have dogs? Almost for certain. Um, there is, they, they must have, I think, Oh, there's a whole new literature that people are developing right now about dogs, or what are sometimes referred to as wolf dogs, uh, and, um, and humans, and the relationship of dogs and humans. And in fact, I believe they suggest that dogs made us human. Uh, I think. I'd, I'd have to go back. And it's some very, very new literature about dogs. Uh, Pat Shipman is the person, and this is, this is dealing with like Upper Paleolithic, Middle to Upper Paleolithic, something like that. There's a lot of discussion whether these really are dogs or whether they are really wolves. People, people always, always, not always, you know, like, like the Inuit in Alaska, they, they, they breed, their, breed their dogs to wolves so that they're always these, these uh, things that are bred with the, with the wild animals. So maybe they started this hundreds of thousands of years ago. I don't know. But, but there is some ideas of that. So that in, that in a way of saying that by 10,000 years ago, yeah, they, I can't imagine they didn't have dogs. Realizing that I think that most of the teepee rings we're aware of these days are from much more recent times, Did you, have you found any evidence of teepee rings for back in that Time period. The archaeological literature suggests that teepee rings originate, whatever that means, um, somewhere in what we call middle archaic, in other words, three, four, five thousand years ago. Um, the site that I'm working on 
that Maggie mentioned, Hell Gap, actually has a ring that was interpreted, I believe, as a teepee ring uh, at 8,000 years ago. Um, I have seen stone rings, at least in the literature, if not in person, um, throughout Siberia and in the Upper Paleolithic and basically throughout the world. Now, so basically people used stones to put around their tents for a long time. There's a couple of things regarding your question. One is what's the difference between a teepee ring and a tent ring? I, honestly, I, I, I don't know. You know, it's a ring of stones that held down a skin around someplace where you lived. Now, okay, I know what a teepee is, but how the heck do I tell the difference between something that was constructed like this versus something that was constructed like this? All I've got is a ring of stones out here. So that's one question that I'm, I don't want to say exploring. I'm trying to get some students to look into that. It's sort of semi-definitional problem anyway. But the other side of that is, yes, what you see on the ground when you go from Sheridan to Buffalo to Montana, wherever you go, is undoubtedly 99% of what you see there probably dates to the last couple of thousand years. Um, you know, with a, with a few exceptions. And, um, you know, that's just because what's on the ground is what, what, what has survived in the ground for what was put there most recently. And even the ground, you know, let's say you go to Powder River, right? And you're walking on the ground on Powder River where it was the last flood that made that last level. So that you can't be looking at teepee rings that are 8,000 years old because you're not looking at the ground that's 8,000 years old. Now it's true when you're on some of the ridges, those ridges have been there since pre-Cambrian, well maybe not pre-Cambrian, but they've been there a long time, <laughs> right? And some of those teepee rings in those instances, they could be old. Seem like there's not a lot of information from what you gave on where these people live, teepees or whatever you call them, skin houses or whatever, but could they have been living in those kinds of things in addition to these uh, stick huts that you had from Asia or whatever? Well, I only use that stick hut from Asia as a model. I think that's the kind of things that, that, that they constructed. I, I think they constructed um, a framework. All, almost all hunter-gatherers do that. They, start, they constructed a framework of saplings and, and things like that whether it was in a teepee form or not in a teepee form, they, 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 they covered it with, with, with skins uh, and, uh, uh, and they sealed it the best they could. They probably had internal liners like teepee rings, uh, like teepees have uh, to keep it warmer. Uh, that's the kind of structures that they had. I think, and this is really stretching the evidence but it really has to be stretched. There are a number of instances like those houses I talked about in the Gunnison Basin and also the later post-Paleo-Indian early archaic houses in Middle Park, There's, that there are 20 of, all of which have some clay. I think they were sealing those things with clay. But what has survived are a few clumps in a house. You know, we don't have a wall that survived or anything else. What survives is what survives, what we have to deal with. But I'm seeing this, I went back to this literature, and darn it, and if every one of them is like, well, there's clay in this one, and there's clay in this one, and there's clay in a couple of those fulsome ones, and I'm going, well, you know, this is telling us something. Why aren't we thinking a little further uh, on this? So, I, maybe they weren't covered with skins, maybe they were actually very tightly woven, uh, saplings and branches and this sort of stuff, uh, and then uh, covered with clay. That would give you a lot of protection. Thank you, Marcel. Thank you all for listening. <laughs>